Oh, my old friends, how lovely to see you. I am Lord Harold Tillingsworth III, the Dean of the History Department at Cambridge University, in case you didn't already know. Today, we are gathered here together, virtually that is, in my modest homestead, to watch the most intriguing military battles. We are discussing one of the most enthralling military engagements, the Six Day War. We will begin by deeply considering the events that occurred on the first day of this confrontation. Subsequently, we will proceed on to a discussion of day two of this conflict. We will then surprise everyone by moving on to day three, the Six Day War. We then will watch the fourth day of the war. Thank you, my dear Lord team. I think that we've got the idea. I'm Amelia, and welcome back to our channel. Indeed, we are ready to tackle an eloquent example of military planning at its finest, the Six Day War. I must say that it wasn't easy for me to put this episode together, since I realized that so many families on both sides of the conflict are still affected by the loss of their relatives and friends, and the wounds are too recent to fully heal. I will try to present the facts as I understand them, knowing that they must be extremely painful and personal for many. For those of you who wish to learn more about the build-up to this engagement, starting with the Suez Crisis, I would like to suggest watching our previous episode, titled The Suez Crisis and the Great Escalation. And for those who are, like myself, anxious to get right down to military action, let's do it. In Israel, the two weeks between the closure of the Strait to Israeli shipping by Egypt in May of 1967 and the start of the Six Day War is known as the Waiting Period. While the Israeli public feared for the very existence of their country, they were relieved when the overwhelmingly popular general, Moshe Dayan, was appointed as the Minister of Defense, with Levi Eshkol retaining the premiership. On June 4th, the Israeli cabinet voted for a preemptive war, and the countdown to fire ignited. Both sides were feverishly preparing for the conflict, but Egypt did not expect that the Israeli forces would attack prior to receiving a formal blessing from the US. In the meantime, Egypt continued to move troops into the Sinai without clear objectives. Egypt did have a comprehensive Soviet-engineered defense plan on the Sinai in the event of an Israeli attack, but there was no coordinated offensive plan, since the initial goal was simply to intimidate the Israeli government by moving a large quantity of troops into the Sinai. It all began at 7.10 a.m. on June 5th of 1967, when 16 Magistar Fuga jets took off from Israel, followed by Uragan bombers, as well as Bisteas and Mirages. By 7.30, almost 200 IAF planes were in the air. All pilots were given strict orders to maintain full radio silence and to fly very low, often 15 to 20 meters above the ground, to avoid detection. Although, no matter how low they flew, Israelis knew that they would be spotted by the most sophisticated monitoring station at Adrun in Jordan. True enough, Jordanians detected an unusually large formation of Israeli planes as early as 7.15 a.m and immediately cabled a very secretive military code word, which happened to be grape, to their Egyptian counterparts. The day before, however, the Egyptian Army Command Center changed the encoding, failing to inform their Jordanian comrades. Thus, the code word remained undeciphered. As a result, Israeli planes enjoyed an element of complete surprise, which was a perfect complement to this brilliantly devised strategy. Dozens of squadrons from several Israeli air bases were supposed to rendezvous over 11 major Egyptian Air Force bases. All but 12 of the Israeli jets were thrown into the attack. Israeli planes achieved an almost unbelievable turnaround time for refueling and rearming, bringing it down to only 8 minutes. In comparison, Egyptian planes had a turnaround time of over 7 hours. The operation, codenamed FOCUS, was wonderfully planned and executed, 
And, once again, Israeli intelligence was superb. Going into the battle, Israelis knew the names of the Egyptian pilots, the exact location of their planes on the ground, and were able to match the voices of most of the Egyptian pilots with their names. Much of it was done through the means of electronic surveillance, but a more traditional means of information gathering, espionage, was widely used as well. Even Nasser's personal massage therapist, Ali al Alfi, supplied information to Israel. The Israeli intelligence boys were fully aware that the Egyptian Air Force parked their planes by type. So, all Aleutian bombers were conveniently parked together, while most MiGs and Tupolev planes were concentrated in separate areas. Jets were parked in the open air, as opposed to in hangars, with no protection. At 7.30 a.m., the Egyptian MiGs had just returned from their morning patrol, with only four training planes remaining in the air, none of which were armed. Ironically, there were two Egyptian Aleutian transport planes in the air as well. They were transferring Field Marshal Amir and Air Force Commander Sidhi Mahmoud. While I have not found any confirmation that the Israeli intelligence operatives knew that all top Egyptian brass would be in the air that morning, one thing is for sure. It was too lucky to be a coincidence. Let me step back a bit. Most of the Air Force bases had some form of air defense systems, such as anti-aircraft batteries. Egypt had 101 of them, with 27 being the advanced SAM-2 missile systems. I am convinced that the Israelis knew that when Amr flew to visit Egyptian air bases, he would issue a no-fire order, out of fear that one of his own air defense boys would mistake his plane for that of Israelis and accidentally shoot him out of the skies. The June 5th visit had proved to be no exception, and all anti-aircraft batteries were told to stand down. And so, they did. Most Egyptian air bases only had one runway. If it was damaged, the entire air base was practically useless. The Israeli jets attacked in a well-rehearsed formation, approaching in foursomes and attacking in pairs, with each pair making three or four passes. The pilots were trained to concentrate their first pass on bombing the runways, hitting them near the start, the middle, and towards the end to render them useless. Once the runways were taken out, the bombing was redirected towards the second priority targets, Egyptian long-range bombers that were conveniently sitting on the ground, all in one place. The third bombing priority of attack was reserved for MiGs and the fourth for anti-aircraft batteries and ammunition storage facilities. Each sortie was to take seven to eight minutes. Add to this the 20 minutes for the return flight and eight minutes for refueling and pilot rest, and planes could be back in action well within an hour. As I mentioned, the bombing priority was given to the destruction of runways. In doing so, the IDF completely surprised Egyptians by using previously unseen bombs that were designed specifically for this purpose, named Durandals. These devices were the result of a top-secret joint venture with the French, and were named after a mythical French sword. Once released, this massive 185-pound bomb was stabilized with a small rocket and a parachute, until it was directly above the target, at which point a booster rocket drove it deep into the pavement, leaving craters 15 feet in diameter and 7 feet deep rendering the runways completely inoperable. The most devilish feature of this bomb was that the runway could not be quickly repaired, as the Durandals had multiple delayed fuses, which continued exploding for several hours, making repairs impossible. Over a hundred of these bombs were released over the Abu Suwer airbase in less than an hour. After trapping the remaining planes on the ground, Israelis used 30mm cannons and heat-seeking rockets to finish the job. At the Luxor Egyptian airbase, colossal Tupolev bombers were sitting on the ground, fully armed, with 10-ton payloads. When they exploded, the force was so great 
that one of the attacking Israeli planes was not able to get in away in time, and was destroyed in the blast. By the end of the first wave, at 8am Israel time, the Egyptian Air Force lost 204 planes, half of their fleet. All but nine of them never had a chance to take off the ground. The IAF lost only eight planes, yet all 101 Egyptian aircraft batteries were silent due to the above-mentioned no-fire order issued by Amer. The second wave of attack destroyed another 107 planes in 100 minutes, losing only nine Israeli planes. Out of a total of 420 combat aircraft, Egypt lost 286 in less than three hours. Almost 32% of all Egyptian pilots were killed and 13 major air bases were completely or largely destroyed. The results of these daring operations were almost too extensive to be believed, and were kept a secret for as long as possible. This silence allowed the Voice of Arabs, a prominent radio station, to promote a contradictory picture, stating that the Egyptian planes supposedly shot down 86 Israeli planes, including an American aircraft, while losing only two. All international phone lines were cut, with the military in full control of information. They didn't just embellish the facts, they invented their own reality, their own matrix. The problem was that even Nasser was not fully aware of the reality of this situation, and only when the supposed number of downed Israeli airplanes rose to 170 did he start to question this story. Ironically, Nasser only learned about the full extent of this disaster from the Soviet ambassador, Pojidayev. This made-up reality ended up being very costly to King Hussein of Jordan. Just a few days before the war, he flew to Cairo to express his full support and signed a mutual defense treaty with Egypt. King Hussein also placed his troops under Egyptian command. While deeply uneasy about going to war against Israel, Jordan had very limited options, as refusal to fight would be political suicide for the young king. If we are going to live, we will live with honor. If we don't make it, we will die with honor. Despite the treaty, King Hussein was desperately hoping that he could delay attacking Israel until the UN imposed ceasefire. But upon hearing these super optimistic reports, he grew more confident, and his air force attacked Israeli air bases. Immediately upon their return for refueling, they were attacked by an overwhelming number of Israeli jets. And in two waves, Israelis completely destroyed the Jordanian Air Force, its runways, planes, and bases. The Syrian Air Force was next on the hit list, losing two-thirds of its Air Force within three hours. At 8.15, Diane issued the Red Sheet password. The ground war was about to begin. Right from the start, the Egyptian army had the massive disadvantage of not having an air cover while the IAF ruled the skies. Other countries, Algeria in particular, were willing to lend Egypt their mix, but with no operational air bases, Egypt could not take advantage of them. The ground war started on the Sinai, where 70,000 IDF infantry and 700 tanks faced 100,000 Egyptian troops. After intensive fighting on the 5th of June, the IDF captured a large part of the Gaza Strip and broke through the Egyptian lines on the Mediterranean coast. More importantly, Israelis captured the strategically important crossroads of Abu Awigla in the eastern part of the peninsula. In the morning of June 6th, the Egyptians counterattacked, fighting bravely, but with the complete air superiority of the Israeli army, this counterattack was crushed by the early afternoon, and Amr lost his nerve. Without consulting his field commanders, he issued an order of general retreat. Since there was no plan for such a retreat, it quickly turned defeat into a rout. While the IDF concentrated their efforts on the Sinai, the Jordanian positions in Jerusalem were well defended with extremely intense fighting leading to considerable casualties on both sides. While the Arab Legion lived up to its reputation as an excellent fighting machine, by June 6th, 
the Jordanian ground forces were besieged in the old city of Jerusalem. Once again, the IAF superiority in the skies made a huge difference, allowing Israelis to bomb the Jordanian armored units that had mounted a very successful campaign on the West Bank with impunity. King Hussein continued to hold out, unwilling to break ranks with other Arab countries, while hoping for a ceasefire, which came too late for Jordan. The old city of Jerusalem fell in the morning of June 7th. On June 8th, Egypt and Syria agreed to a ceasefire, but Israel pushed forward, capturing the Golan Heights from Syria before concluding hostilities on June 10th. On that day, the Six-Day War was over, and just like its mythical alter ego, the Six-Day War had indeed led to the creation of a new world, a new Middle Eastern world order. On June 9th, Nasser went on the radio, acknowledged the defeat, suggested U.S. participation as its root cause, and tendered his resignation. <laughs> في أوقات النصر وفي أوقات المحنة في الساعات الحلوة وفي الساعات المرة أن نجلس معا Many individual stories that I came across led to believe that this speech might have been the catalyst for a reversal of Arab countries' attitudes towards the United States, which, unlike Britain and France, had never been tainted by a colonial past. In fact, for a short time, during the famous Wilsonian 14 points post-war one euphoria, the U.S. was elevated to a beacon of hope status for those seeking independence from colonialism. The 20-year period between the 1948 al-Nakba and the 1967 Six-Day War transformed the U.S. image in the eyes of the Arab public into something quite different, something on par with Britain and France. All but four Arab countries, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Tunisia, and Kuwait, severed relations with the United States for its perceived role in the 1967 war. By now, we know that the claims of direct U.S. military participation in the Six-Day War have limited basis. In fact, the IDF bombing of the USS Liberty on the fourth day of the war pushed Israel and the U.S. into a very uncomfortable position. The Liberty was a surveillance ship, which provided the U.S. with eyes on the conflict. I can imagine a dozen reasons why such a monitoring device in Israel's backyard might have been highly inconvenient. While at the start of the conflict, the U.S. was only a lukewarm supporter of Israel, the wild ride of Egyptian anti-American propaganda pushed the U.S. towards Israel, while antagonizing Arab public sentiment even more. Nasser's resignation was met with widespread opposition from the Egyptian population, and he rescinded his resignation. Other Egyptian leaders responsible for the disaster had to face much more than self-criticism. In August of 1967, the commander-in-chief, Abdul Hakim Amer, along with 50 senior officers, were arrested for allegedly plotting a coup. On September 13th, Amer died under mysterious circumstances, with suicide as the official cause of death. Many sources suggest that the decision to commit suicide was not entirely Amr's. In general, just like in 1948, the defeat of Arab armies set off a crisis of confidence in Arab political leaders. In the aftermath, public disenchantment set off a chain of revolutions and coups. In Iraq, the Ba'ath Party took over. King Idris of Libya was overtaken by an Egyptian-style free officers movement, led by Colonel Muammar al-Qaddafi. In 1970, the Syrian president, Nur al al-Atassi, was overthrown by a military coup led by Hafiz al-Assad, the father of the current Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad. Many subsequent events can also be indirectly traced to this pivotal moment in Middle Eastern history, including the rise of Saddam Hussein, the Gulf War, and September 11th, just to name a few. The one event that bears direct connection to the Israeli victory in this conflict 
is the Yom Kippur War. If you liked this episode, I would be very grateful if you would leave a comment below. Also, please like this video and consider subscribing to our channel, The Most Intriguing Military Battles. Also, please like this video and subscribe to our channel. The most. <laughs>